like a lot of people took the holiday. <laughs> That's okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to news. Um, thank you again for being good sports and sitting right here. Um, but like we've been, like I've been saying for a long time, we're, we're finally getting near the end. We've been going through Acts for a long time, and um, to kind of speed up the process, we've been doubling up. So I got another double chapter for you, which means a lot of reading coming up. Um, it's exciting reading, though, because it's a story, a really cool story of, of how God was working through Paul. Um, but, but with that, before we get started, like, the, the question I want to pose to you today is, where does your faith come from? What is the substance of your faith? What makes you positive and absolutely sure that what you believe is true? I'm not going to ask you to answer this right now. I just want you to think. What gives my faith substance? What separates my beliefs from, from that of someone else? Someone who believes in something completely different. What's special about Christianity? That, that's a question for today. So, let's get on to lots of reading. Alright, Acts 23 to, 20, uh, 23 to 24. You can turn with me with your Bibles. You can... Load up your smartphones, or you can look on the screen. All right, Acts 23. Word of the Lord says this. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. That's a pretty, he called him a whitewashed wall. <laughs> That's some serious business, right? Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Talk about that in a second. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the laws who, who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. 
Then he called two of his centurions and or, where am I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> he wrote a letter as follows: Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as uh, Antip Antipatris. The next day they, they, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their ch charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. And your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. I'm just trying to mix it up, all right? <laughs> Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to des desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. It sounds like a lawyer, right? Um, the other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and, this, and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men before, um, themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean uh, when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance, but there, were, there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or those who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, uh, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He, he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by, by Portius Festus. And became, uh, and, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Amen. Long passage. A lot of stuff going on. Um, to kind of go back and, and, and recap where we're at. Last week when we were going through the last two chapters, Paul went back to Jerusalem. And this is after a, a relatively long career as a missionary. He had been doing missions for probably about 10 years at this point. 
He had gone all around Asia, all around Europe, planted tons of churches, had, had invested in, in two, in, in Ephesus and Corinth. And God led him, and God called him back to Jerusalem, even though he knew that suffering was waiting for him. People kept telling him, don't go, don't go. But he still went. And he goes there, and he's basically minding his business. He's just worshiping, and he's... he's He's going through a, a, a ceremonial a ceremony cleansing with some other men. And they find him. And, and they start picking a fight. And a riot breaks out because of this man, Paul. And just as they're about to beat him to death, the Romans intervene. And they rescue him and find out what's going on. And so he starts talking to the crowd. And Paul talks to the crowd and basically starts proclaiming the gospel. And he, he really proclaims that the gospel is for everyone, not just the Jews. And the Jews get upset, and they start rioting again. And just as the centurion is taking him away to beat him again, they find out that he's a Roman citizen. And this leads to where we're at today. Now, before we get further, one, one thing to note is that this was a very politically unstable time for the Jews. The Jews did not like having someone over them. So they did not like being under Roman authority. And so during this time, there were a lot of militant uh, rebellions. There were, there were people that raised up all sorts of riots. There was a group called the Zealots that they, were, they, they wanted to militarily overthrow Rome and, and give uh, Israel its, its independence once more. So during this time, there was a lot of crazy things going on among the Jews. And there had been other people before Paul that were kind of getting the crowd riled up. And so this was the reason why the Romans were being very careful about the situation. And so they lead him to the Sanhedrin. Paul is taken to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are, are basically the religious leaders of the Jews. And so the, the Sanhedrin would be a council of priests, scribes, and, and, and aristocrats. Right? There, there are these, these royal people. And they would decide religious matters. And so they, they, they discerned that Paul was creating a religious conflict, so we're going to put him in front of this council. Now in this council, there are two main factions. There are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were basically the rich people. Right? They were the people that had the power. They were the people that made most of the decisions. You know, in our context, they would be the pampodam, pampodongsan. <laughs> they were the rich people, right? They, these were the people that had influence. They had reputation. Now, the Pharisees, these were the guys that, that in many ways were the upstarts. They were actually the liberals of the time. I'll, I'll get back to more of that in a second. But they were the ones that really loved the Word of God and taught the Word of God to other people. And the people really respected them a lot. So they had a lot of favor, not because of their wealth, but because of the respect among the people. But the main difference between the two was because these men were so into the Word of God, they actually believed it. They believed that what happened in the Word of God was true. So they believed in the spiritual realm. They believed in resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in spirits. Whereas the Sadducees, they were the skeptics. They didn't really believe any of that stuff existed. And even though they were in power and in control, they, they really doubted that there was much to the spiritual world. And so there was a divide in the, the leaders of, of, of the Jews. And so Paul was pretty crafty. Paul, remember, Paul used to be a Pharisee. If, if, if he had not been converted, Paul would probably be a member of the Sanhedrin. Paul was on his way up to be the top Pharisee of his generation. He would probably be in that same seat that the others were in. And so he knew the way to split them up was to bring about the issue of spirituality. To talk about resurrection. And to create that divide. But one thing to remember is when we look at the Bible, a lot of times we look at Pharisees very negatively. Right? It's like a, it's like a, like a Christian curse word. You Pharisee! Oh, don't call me that. Right? <laughs> It's got this negative connotation. And yes, they took it the wrong way. In many ways, Jesus calls out the Pharisees for many of their flaws. But at the same time, 
some of the people in the Bible that Jesus has a really strong and, and intimate connection with were Pharisees. These men knew the Word of God. And they revived the Word of God in a time where the, where the Jews had gone away. Really, before Jesus had come, what happened was, Israel was, was during this, this, this exilic period. They were exiled, they were no longer free, and they, they went away from the Word of God. They started to forget who God was. Before Jesus came, the Pharisees rose from that, grabbed onto the Word of God, and brought it back to the people. And in many ways, they were heroes. People respected them because they gave them back the Bible, essentially, the Torah. Now they, they took it too far. They became very legalistic. And that's the problem with the Pharisees. But in general, the Pharisees actually did a lot of great things. And Paul used to be one of them. And in all honesty, I, what I see in this passage, because when you look through Acts, actually in some of the previous passages that we covered, a lot of Pharisees became Christians. Many of them actually probably became prominent Christian leaders. Because think about it. These guys know the Word of God better than anybody else. If Jesus is real, they would be the first to figure it out. And so in many ways, a lot of Pharisees became believers. And the interesting thing in this passage is when Paul declares resurrection is the main issue, all of a sudden, these Pharisees that were probably earlier wanting him to die, were like, wait a minute, maybe a spirit or an angel talked to him. Right? And that's what the passage says. All of a sudden, they were questioning their own stance. Because they realized, because they heard his testimony. He had shared his testimony in the previous passage and talked about how Jesus had come to him. They realized if what he was saying was true, if this man who had died, because you have to remember that no one questioned whether Jesus existed at this point. right? In today's society, there are a lot of people who are like, did Jesus exist? We question that now, but back then, they knew that he had existed. Many of them had seen Jesus ten years prior. They remembered that there was this man, they had witnessed a lot of the miracles Jesus had done. That was not a question at the time. The question was, who is he? Not that he existed, not about even some of the things that he had done, but who is Jesus? That was the question of the time. And they realized that when Paul said, this man resurrected himself from the dead, that meant that what he said was true. Let me get back to that in a second. So going further in the passage, God himself reveals to Paul that, you know what? Jerusalem is not where this is going to end. You're going to continue on to Rome. And that's going to factor in in the next passages when, when Paul declares his right to go to Rome. Okay, we'll get to that later. But here we see God himself is telling Paul, you're going to go on to Rome. You're going to be my witness, not just from Jerusalem, but also in Rome. And then all of a sudden, you see this plot. These guys are serious, right? They're like, we're, we're not going to eat or drink until this man is dead. That's pretty serious. I don't know about you, but if I had 40 people that said they ain't going to eat or drink before I die, I'll be pretty scared. <laughs> you know, hopefully these guys would get skinny and die themselves. I don't know. <laughs> but, but these guys were taking it seriously. There was a definite threat to Paul in Jerusalem. I want to make that very clear. Paul's life was in danger. These men would stop at nothing to kill him. And so... They find out about this, the, the, the Romans find out, and the, the commander decides to send him to Caesarea. It's a, a nearby city. It's a few days' walk away. And it was going to be under the decision of this Governor Felix. Now, Governor Felix, his authority was just one level below um, the, the emperor, right? So only Caesar could have a higher voice than this governor. So this is a very high position that Paul is being sent to. But when Paul presents his case before Governor Felix, it becomes very clear that Paul didn't break any Roman laws. Paul was just at temple worshiping. All of a sudden, these people grab him and start throwing accusations. There was nothing he did by Roman law that, that required him to be punished. 
And so, you know, the commander knew this. The commander saw that this was a Jewish issue. So he wanted the Sanhedrin to figure out, but the Sanhedrin were going crazy. So he didn't know what to do. So he sends them to, to Felix. And it's Felix's decision to figure out how do we resolve this issue. But then you see that Felix, it even says Felix was familiar with Christianity. Remember, this is about more than 10 years after Jesus, right? So at this point, Christianity, what they called the way, was not an unknown entity. It had traveled all around the world, so much so that this governor knew about it. Now granted, his wife was Jewish, so that probably helped. But you have to realize that at this point, Christianity, or the way as it was called, wasn't an unfamiliar thing. Many people were aware of what it was. But even so, this man who's familiar with Christianity knows that Paul has not done anything wrong by Roman law. He plays politics. You see that two years pass. And then he actually, his term ends and someone replaces him. So this man does nothing. He had all the authority to end it right there and say, this man is innocent, you may be free. He could have done that. But he played politics. It talks about how he did it as a favor to the Jews. He knew that if he released this man, that the Jews would get really upset, and that would cause a lot of problems for him. And so he said, you know what? I just keep him in jail. We'll just keep delaying the trial, and nothing will happen. No one likes the word politics. Right? <laughs> you say the word politics and already your skin starts to crawl. You're like, oh, politics. Right? It's become such a negative word. And the reason why is because of human nature. Right? Every form of government cannot get rid of human nature. This man, the reason why he's delaying the, the sentence is because... He wants to keep his position higher. He doesn't care about Paul. All he cares about is not upsetting other people. He's trying to keep everybody else happy. Now with politics, you know, there is no form of politics or there is no form of government that doesn't get influenced by human nature. So, you know, like back in the whole communism days, communism, if you read it on paper, it sounds brilliant. Right? You read it and you're like, oh, this is very intelligent. If this works out, cool. But it doesn't factor in human nature. And it doesn't factor in that people will abuse power. And that's why ultimately communism failed. Right? We look to the north, we see it's still failing. We, we look all around the world and it's crumbled. And you know, it's really interesting for me because I grew up in, in the Cold War. Right? I'm, I'm, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Okay? And so, I grew up in America, and we were, we were paranoid. We were scared of Russia, right? Mother Russia, right? We were worried about like there would be movies about nuclear war. Um, there would be like you know like there's this general paranoia, and, and and it's really interesting because one of the things I miss about the Cold War is it's really weird. Like I grew up in the Cold War, but one of the things I liked about the Cold War was that there was always someone to blame. Right? Like, ah, those Russians. Right? So, like, there was an enemy, right? But now we live in a world, we live in an age where there isn't necessarily a clear enemy. So now it's like, you don't know who to blame. You're like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> like, I, 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 there's no scapegoat anymore. And then the interesting thing for me is my parents became missionaries to Russia back in, in the year 2000. And so I ended up living there with them for a year as a missionary in Russia. And I thought about it. I was like, this is crazy. When I was a kid... I would have never, ever thought that I would be living in Russia, right? Where they're like looking at me like, ah, oh, Amerikansky. You know, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, it just boggled my mind. And um, the interesting thing about Russia, and I'm, this is a real tangent, uh, but the interesting thing about Russia is they had lived so long with the government in control of everything that once the government collapsed, First off, the people that took over were the Mafia. Right? Honestly, the Russian Mafia still controls everything. I should be careful because this is recorded. They might get to me. But anyway. Um, but but you, you saw this power vacuum. But when I, when I saw the people there, um, 
Russia has become a very hedonistic society. What I mean by that is that everyone is just looking for pleasure. They just want to have a good time. But when you look around, like I would go to a, like a beach there, and number one, the beach is actually there's like these rock shards everywhere. It's like dangerous, right? And like and it's weird because you see these Russians and they're like their feet are bleeding. They're just like walking around. They don't even seem to notice it. I'm like, what's going on? But I look around, you see all like the place is jam packed. It's crowded. And you look around, and they all look unhappy to look. They're supposed to be having fun, right? They're at, a, they're at a beach, and they just all look stone-faced and angry. And then I guess they don't have suntan lotion there, because they're all, like, bright red. <laughs> but, but I noticed that the Russians were really just looking to enjoy themselves. And then because the government had been in control of their lives for so long, they were still waiting for the government to fix everything. And it was just like stuck. Russia was just stuck. I know it's changed a bit since then. Um, and, and I would interact with some of the younger people, and I would be encouraged by them because they seem very bright, they seem very passionate. But within, when I asked them about their ambitions and dreams, they all told me that they wanted to go to another country. And I was like, come on. This country needs you here. Like, if you want to see change, it needs you here. And they're like, oh, I want to go to America or Canada and make a lot of money. And then when I retire, I'll come back. I'm like, come on, <laughs> it's too late. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about Russia so much. Oh, well, politics, okay. Um, so that's where the story ends, and it's going to continue. There's going to be a different governor, and there's going to be more to this process. But the interesting thing, and I want you to just keep this in mind as we continue through the story, is Paul speaks very differently depending on who his audience is. You'll see that more as we continue. But just in this passage, you see him very respectful and, and deferent to Governor Felix. But then, with Ananias, man, he called him a whitewashed wall. I don't even know what that means. It sounds bad. <laughs> you whitewashed wall, right? Now, and, then, then he, see, he, and then it's funny because they say, like, how dare you speak to the high priest about that? He said, and he acts like he doesn't know. He's like, oh, my bad. <laughs> I didn't know that was a high priest. And actually what's going on there was Ananias, historically, had kind of unlawfully taken that position. And so what you're seeing is Paul is actually being crazy sarcastic, right? Some would say Paul is trolling right there. <laughs> and, and Paul is, is just messing with, with Ananias because he, he disrespects him. He, he feels that Ananias shouldn't be in that position of high priest, which many others also believe as well. So it's interesting. You, you see these little snippets of, of Paul's like, like personality. Totally being sarcastic there. Totally being disrespectful. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, but, but you'll see that also as we continue in the passage, that to different audiences, Paul speaks very differently. Now, what is the main point of today's passage? What is the unifying theme of these two chapters? When it comes down to it, it's all about resurrection. And I title this passage, Risen, because it's all about our risen Lord. Now, if you, were to continue, if you want to know more about Paul's stance on resurrection, read 1 Corinthians 15. He, he devotes an entire chapter to talking about what the resurrection means to Christians. And just to really briefly sum it up, if Christ was not risen, then what is the point of our faith? Right? If Christ did not rise from the grave, we are worshiping someone who basically just died. Right? A, a really cool guy, an awesome guy, died. Tragedy. Sad story. But there's no reason to have faith in that if he's not resurrected. Brothers and sisters, this is the main point of today. Is that we don't worship just some guy that, that had cool teachings. We don't worship someone who did some cool tricks. Right? We worship someone who proved his point. That he was and is the Son of God. And the only way he could do that is by showing that he had power over death. All those other things that he did, we even see in the book of Acts, Paul and Peter, they end up doing a lot of the same miracles Jesus did himself. They resurrected some fools, right? 
So the only way that Jesus differentiates himself from his own followers is that he actually rose from the dead. And then he also went to heaven straight. Without that, Christianity is nothing, brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 15 is very clear on that. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how many witnesses saw the risen Lord. Talks about how, you know, like, like you know, the 150 so out disciples all saw him, and like 300 people saw him go up into heaven. Paul is being very specific because he's saying there is evidence that this happened. All these people, you can go up to them and ask them what happened. They will all say the same thing. Resurrection is the key to our faith. And Paul absolutely recognizes it. Now for many of you, there, there are things that have happened that have strengthened your faith. Right? You have had personal experiences. You have had mentors in your life. You have had like crazy events happen in your life and those strengthen your faith but the substance to our faith does not exist without resurrection you take away resurrection you take away everything and yet we live in an age where some people don't actually believe this happened we live in an age where people think you know what Jesus Okay, maybe he existed. That's still a question. Some people still question whether he existed. Honestly, I think it's a very weak argument because there's so much evidence that he did. But let's say you say he existed. But the most common thing people say is not that, you know, Jesus was the Son of God. They're like, oh, Jesus was a cool guy. He taught us some cool things. I like, I like Jesus. Right? You hear a lot of stuff like that, but they deny that he's the Son of God. And so there's a lot of people that look to him as just a teacher, as a cool friend, but deny his deity. And I, I like the way Timothy Keller puts it, because Jesus gives you no room to make that decision. Jesus, if you actually believe what he says as truth, doesn't allow you to make that distinction of him just being a teacher. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. All these things say very clearly, very black and white, that either I'm the Son of God or I'm a crazy man. I think C.S. Lewis wrote something along that line. But, but Timothy Keller basically put it as, you either crown him or you crucify him. Jesus doesn't give you that option to go anywhere in between. And so what Paul makes very clear is, it's all about the resurrection. If he is not risen then honestly, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about it. We are to be most pitied, right? If the resurrection never happened, then we are the biggest idiots on the planet. What are we doing? <laughs> Paul makes that very clear. And so when the question comes, where does your faith come from? It comes from the fact that we worship a risen Lord. That's what separates us from anybody else is that, number one, he's, he's the Son of God. He died on the cross, but he actually raised from the dead. You have to put all that together. You know, we sang about the cross. You know, I, you know when, when Passion, the Passion of Christ came out? Um, man, it's been a long time, huh? <laughs> it's like, like 10 years, something like that, right? More than 10 years. I think it was like 2003 or something like that. But anyway, Passion comes out. Passion of Christ. Mel Gibson makes it. Everyone, everyone goes. Um, I actually ended up seeing late. Because uh, for some reason I wasn't able to watch it right when it came out. But because I watched it a little bit later, I heard about some of the stuff that got kind of added in. Which helped. Because if I would watched it without knowing that, I would have been really upset. I would have like walked out of the theater, I think. But anyway, I knew about it. So I sat through there. And man, that movie is just... I only watched it once, honestly. I didn't want to watch it again. Um, just because it's very intense. But what I, the thing that I dislike the most about that movie, aside from all the extra stuff that Mel Gibson added, is, is the simple fact that the resurrection has like three seconds in the movie. Right? It's at the end, all of a sudden you see like, 
like a silhouette of Jesus with like a like you know like a you know like you see like a hole in his hand or whatever, and you just see him like walking, and then the credits come up. I was like, what? Wait, that that's the main point, <laughs> right? Yeah, he suffered. Yeah, he died. And like these are very important things for us to know. But the most important thing is that he raised from the dead, and that got the least amount of screen time in that entire movie. And so, brothers and sisters, I want us to remember that our faith has no substance without the resurrection. And with the resurrection, with, with the resurrection, we have hope for a future. Because it points to the coming King, the return, and when we will join Him forever. So brothers and sisters, I, I just hope that, that we're able to, to understand and, and receive what Paul knew to be the core of faith is that we don't worship just some cool guy with a lot of cool teachings and did a lot of cool tricks. We worship the Son of God who died for our sins and was resurrected, raised from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, and pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember, Lord, that there is substance to our faith. That there is truth, Lord, because... Lord, if this didn't happen, this would have been an easy thing to disprove long, long ago. And yet no one could question that Jesus was raised from the dead. No one could question that back then, Lord. So Father, I, I pray, Lord, that we would remember, Lord, the truth that we worship a risen Son. As the Son was raised again, He proved Himself to be your Son, all-powerful. That is where our faith gains its substance, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that if there has ever been any question, Lord, any doubts, Lord, I pray, Lord, that You would remove them from our hearts, Lord. And, Lord, that we would accept this truth stand confident in the faith that you've mercilessly granted us. So Father, be glorified. Help us to know, Lord, that that, that you desire us to, to be just confident in our faith. And may you be glorified, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, and praise you all in the name of Jesus. Amen.